today we have a special set of guests from industry, uh, industry partner called Curiosity Software Limited. If you have any questions about working in industry, today is a very good day to ask them. <laughs> And after uh, uh, part two, so part one will be a presentation from, from Curiosity Software. I'm not going to say too much, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. <laughs> but part two will be me telling stories about uh, some experiences I've had in the industry which are very unusual. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I will let uh, James continue. No way, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, so we are from a company called Curiosity Software, and we are in the software testing space, which is terribly glamorous. Um, but basically, we're going to be talking a little bit about what we do. Um, hopefully, we'll give a bit of insight into, you know, the technology we're using, kind of what software testing is in the real world. Um, and hopefully, we'll talk about kind of some of our customers and what they do as well. Okay. So we've kind of come up with this little agenda with Bob's help. So we're going to start off by talking about who are we, what we do, I guess. Then I'm going to show you a little bit of our software and we'll look at kind of what technology stack we use. Um, we're then going to look at what is software testing, um, maybe just define it a little bit. And then I think for the session, it would kind of be better if it's more hands on. So we're going to go through and look at some real world examples. We'll look at an e-commerce system, We'll look at how people would test that by manual testing. Um, we'll then go into looking at something called automated testing, um, which is all about kind of running automated scripts to test software. Um, and then we'll look at something which is what we specialize in, which is called model-based testing, which is kind of a visual version of testing, creating models of an application and how it should work. Okay. Um, and then at the end, we thought we'd just finish with some tips and hopefully that'll kind of tee up Bob's next session um, to going into kind of, you know, working in industry and some of his experiences. So my name is James Walker. This is George. He's going to introduce himself after. Um, but basically, my journey kind of started in academia. So I met Bob at Swansea University. Um, probably spent far too long in university. Did a BSc, Masters, then a PhD. Um, but when I was doing my undergrad, Bob introduced me to my now business partner, Hugh Price. Um, and at the time he was doing a session, um, Bob set me up for an internship. And basically that kind of got me my first job in industry, which was at a company called Grid Tools. Um, spent about four years there um, afterwards. I was employed there. Um, we then got acquired by a big American company called CA Technologies. Um, spent about two years there. Um, wasn't terribly exciting. Working in a big corporate, there's an awful lot of kind of red tape. It was much more fun working in a startup. So stayed there for about two years and then went off and started my own company, um, which is now called Curiosity Software. At the time it was called Test Flip. Um, but basically I spent about six months by myself. Um, my, my now business partner, Hugh Price, he spent two years at the company that got acquired. Um, he then left, set up his own company as well. And then about a year later, we had some of our kind of old customers get in touch with us and we ended up merging the two companies together. So we've had Curiosity Software for about four years now. Um, we're about 25 employees. Um, so we've grown quite quickly um, and also we're looking to grow a lot more over the next few years. So yeah, we're going to talk about Curiosity Software today. Um, we'll give you a bit of an introduction about what we do, but mostly it's going to be kind of focused on the testing aspect and talking about some kind of real world examples, how people test. All right, you move. Yeah, so uh, hi everyone, my name is George Blundell. Um, so, as you can see on screen there, um, I was a student at University of Nottingham. So, I actually spent three years previously at, um, well, just in the city at Nottingham Trent University. Um, I was sort of doing a, more of a business course there. Um, and then, uh, once I graduated from Nottingham Trent, I came over to uh, the, the bright side, University of Nottingham, um, where I do, well, I did, uh, it was an economics graduate um, and a frequent mooch visitor at the University Park campus. Probably spent way too much time there. 
um, which probably had a negative impact on my grade, but I still made it, so <laughs> here we are. So I joined Curiosity um, about two and a half years ago. Um, so initially it was on sort of an internship or an initial three months basis. Um, and then when I started my master's, I, I continued at Curiosity um, uh, as sort of a part-time employee. And the past year and a half, uh, I've been working at, well, with the sort of technical implementation team. So working quite closely with a lot of our different customers um, all over the world, really. So that can be, uh, well, we do a lot of work with guys in Australia, which leads to very early mornings. Um, and then we do a lot of work um, you know, in San Francisco and Los Angeles, which leads to very, very late nights. So we're working with you know, a huge range of customers all around the globe. Um, and I've been doing that for about, um, I guess, two and a half years now. And um, yeah, so it's good to be back at, at University in Nottingham. It's been, been a while since I, mm. since I came back. Uh, actually, my, my master was cut short by COVID. So um, I missed the sort of the last two or three months of, a, of actually what ended up being a very nice summer. Um, being sat at home doing nothing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that's me. I'll hand back to Ooh. James to talk about what's next. Uh, yeah, okay. So Curiosity Software, fine. I think we've spoken a little bit about us already. Um, so our primary space that we're in, um, this is a little picture of some of the team. Um, we all got together for the last time, well, for the first time about a year ago. It's kind of weird with COVID going on. So most of the people we hired, probably about 12 or 13 of them we hadn't met for a year everyone was working remotely everyone was onboarded remotely it was very weird um, we've actually got a christmas party on friday where we've got 26 people getting together so but yeah it's, it's an unusual time i guess to be kind of starting a career or starting your journey at a new company but i guess that's kind of the way of the world at the moment um, but anyway so we are focused on kind of two main areas um, one of the areas that we focus on is test data. So if you think about most systems these days, especially you know, in the world of finance, they're very kind of data dependent. You know, you've got um, various you know, financial systems settling different um, exchanges. I mean, if you think about the stock exchange, right, it's all based on data that's behind it. Right? So one of the areas that we focus on is something called test data management or test data automation. And it's all about helping companies get the test data they need to be able to develop software or test it, okay? If you boil it down to kind of basic primitive things, it's kind of just going in and generating random data um, for companies, okay? Um, the other area that we're in is model-based testing, um, which is what we'll look at primarily today. And that is basically just a visual form of testing. You know, it's all about creating diagrams, creating images to help people test their software, okay? So we're about four years now, we've got 25 employees, we're kind of growing bigger and bigger. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you a little bit about the software that we kind of create. And hopefully, this is not gonna stay as a blank screen. Let's have a look. Yeah, that is loading, I think. Yeah, good. So this is basically one of the pieces of software we deliver. Okay, it's a web-based platform. Um, there's things like projects, there's different menus on the left-hand side, there's you know, folder structures, and there's you know, different parts of the application. Okay, now I'm just gonna go into a little bit some of the technology stack that we use. Okay, so obviously this is a web-based platform. Okay, now sat behind it, there is something which is called a multi-tiered architecture, which is kind of quite a common term that's used out there for people creating software. Basically, that just means there is an API sat in the background, there is a web front end, there's a database, and we've got various agents living off it as well. Okay, it's not the most complex piece of software in the world. Okay, most of our engineering team, they develop in Java. Um, I guess you guys have had some experience with Java, maybe. Um, there's also a web front end, which is developing HTML, and it uses Angular as well, which is quite there's two out there at the moment, it's Angular and React. Those are kind of the two, I would say, main kind of components that people use for developing web apps. And then we've also got quite a bit of C Sharp going on as well. I think a lot of people we have hired have been from, they've not necessarily had experience in Java and C Sharp. They have used different languages. I think as long as you know a programming language, you can interchange between them. You know, if you look at most of the syntax, most of the way, you know, you create objects, 
or you call different functions, it's pretty much the same. There's just different notations, and different libraries available. So that's the stack we chose, rightly or wrongly. Um, but um, you know, we have hired people from different backgrounds and they've had no problem picking up these other languages. Um, for source control, we use something called GitHub. Um, I don't know if you guys have used Git before, maybe. Um, but GitHub is pretty much the industry standard now for storing source control within a company. Um, there's kind of this new world, this new thing that's going on called containerization. Um, there's something called Docker, which lives out there. Every piece of software we create is containerized, and basically that is just a way of deploying software. It makes it very easy to ship software, it's very transferable, and it makes the environments incredibly easy to kind of duplicate and bring out. Um, we also deliver all of our software in the cloud. I think a lot of people get very hung up on things like AWS and Google Cloud. Really, delivering software to the cloud is just another mechanism of delivering software and making it available to customers. Um, you know, traditionally, before we had cloud platforms available, we would just go out and we would buy a server, we would ship software onto it, or we would work with a customer and we would tell them, you need to have this environment available within your organization. Now, everyone is kind of moving towards the cloud, and basically that just means instead of deploying software on a dedicated environment they've set up, we're just deploying the software into AWS or onto Google Cloud and one of the environments they've spun up. Okay. So a lot of people get quite scared by the cloud, I think, and all these different platforms. It's literally just a server that you deploy to. It's not complex as people make it out to be. Um, I think as well, a lot of the way we develop software now, it's all about kind of finding cool libraries. So if you go on Git and just do a search, you will find so much stuff out there already. Most of the software we have created has just been assembling different libraries. And our kind of unique source is just going in and, you know, you're coming up with maybe one or two pieces of unique functionality, but it's literally, most of the work we do is finding stuff that exists and connecting it together, maybe buying some licenses for some software. And I think the way we develop software has pretty much changed fundamentally because there's so much open source stuff out there, right? It's kind of crazy. So, you know, one of the reasons why we started Curiosity Software, and I think this is quite a famous image actually, um, but this basically represents, you know, different people's interpretations of what they think should be built, okay? And, you know, it starts in the left, it's, you know, how the customer explained it, and then at the very end, it's, you know, kind of what was actually built, what the customer really needed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of different people's interpretations of how things should be built. And, you know, it's unbelievable some of the customers you work with, you know, big names, big banks, big technology companies, they still fundamentally have this problem where the wrong things get built, you know, and that leads to projects being delayed, projects being, you know, thrown away, things having to be rebuilt, ends up costing a lot of money and a lot of time, okay? So we basically started Curiosity Software to help address this problem. We want people to be, well, we want customers to be able to go out, tech companies, whatever, go out and be able to build the right software that their customers need, and it's also got to be quality software okay, that actually works in the way it was meant to at the beginning. And that's kind of the mantra of the company. Okay. Now, to do that, you know, software testing is actually pretty fundamental. Okay. Does the software work as it was meant to? Okay. Does the software meet the initial requirements? And you know, in the testing space, there's actually a lot of different methodologies for doing testing. Okay. There's things like acceptance testing, which is actually you know, does that piece of software meet the initial, you know, requirement that was put out? But there's also other types of testing as well, like performance testing. You know, if you think about e-commerce customers or e-commerce companies, on Black Friday, you know, they're getting this huge volume of, you know, users onto their website, right? Can the, can the website support the volume of users they're going to expect? And I think Black Friday is particularly interesting because you actually see a lot of websites end up crashing, right? because they have not performance tested their website to that level of volume of users that are actually hitting that website in the end, okay? And there's various tools and techniques out there for performance testing. There's things like JMeter, um, there's things like Taurus, and they are specific languages for performance testing websites and stress testing them, essentially. Um, we're probably gonna look at mostly functional testing, which is kind of thinking through the eyes of an end user. So, you know, you've got a website and you're going to actually perform some test cases on that. Enter text into this field, click this button, 
um, you know, assert this, that this error message is displayed when it eventually come through. Um, there's also different types of testing that's coming out now, like access, accessibility testing, um, which is more about you know, looking at how accessible is this website to people with you know, perhaps certain disabilities like color blindness, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So there is a lot of different types of testing, but we're mostly going to you know, focus on functional testing. Okay. And to us, software testing is all about providing confidence to people that the, what they're delivering actually works as it should. Um, and I think confidence is the key word here. You know, I, I personally, and I'm sure Bob will probably talk about this later, I've personally worked in a lot of companies where we are delivering software that has not been tested and there is a massive risk with that software that we're delivering that does it actually work as it, as it was meant to in the first place. And you end up seeing a lot of software which actually has a lot of bugs in it as a result. So this is where we're going to go pretty hands-on, I guess. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on an e-commerce system. This is an open source e-commerce system. Um, I think it's called Magento, um, but it's pretty standard. You know, you've got different categories, you've got different you know, items you can go in and purchase. You know, there's a login screen, there's a screen to create an account. Um, you know, it's pretty standard functionality, right? And we're going to go through different phases of how we can test this piece of software. And you know, we're going to look at how people typically would test this within industry. Okay, we're not going to look at anything obscene. It's literally going to be this is the process people are using within some of the companies that we're working with at the moment. Okay. So the first piece of software, which I think almost every company is now using, is called Jira. Um, and Jira is basically a project management tool. Okay. And basically, Jira is used to create tasks for developers to go in and create different you know, features within an application, for instance. Okay. So if I was building an e-commerce system, I might come in here and I might create a new task. That would have a summary, a description, and an assignee. Okay. I would say almost every company we work with in the software development space is using Jira at the moment. It's probably the most popular one. And I strongly suspect if you go in to work for a software development company, they will be using Jira as their kind of project management system of choice. Now, within Jira, there is the possibility to create test cases. Okay, so we're going to think about firstly creating some manual test cases for this e-commerce system that we have here. Okay, it's really not terribly exciting. We'll go for it. So we're going to create a test case which is going to be for creating a new user. Okay. And this test case is going to be for um, checking that a new user can sign up to the web page. Okay, I'm going to assign this to me. It's a pretty crucial bit of functionality, so I'm going to give it a high level of priority. Okay, I'm going to click create, and that is going to go off and create a new ticket down here. And we can open that up and we can see it. Okay. Now at this level, what I can do is I can actually come in and I can start to provide some test steps. Okay. And these steps are basically going to be our kind of definition for the test case that we're going to be creating. So firstly, we're going to add a new step. Okay. And the first thing we need to do to test this kind of screen that we've got here is we need to go to the web page. So we're going to open the URL. This is the URL for the website. We don't have any data associated to it, but the expected result is that the web page should load correctly. Okay. Step one. Fine. If I want to register a new user, I then need to go in and perform another step. And that will be I need to come in here and enter a first name. So I'm going to enter a first name into the first name field. That first name could be anything. I'll just put my name in, James. And the expected result here is the first name goes into the first name field. And we could keep on going like this. You know, I'm pretty sure you can see this is pretty tedious. It's pretty boring. It's really not interesting. Um, but a lot of people, this is their kind of day-to-day -day job. They will be going into applications. They will be figuring out test cases to go through. 
and it will literally be coming in, adding this step by step. And it's not just like there's one test case or 10 test cases. You know, for some companies, for big applications, there could be tens of thousands of manual test cases. Okay, so, you know, if you're into manual testing, you end up in a manual testing job. It's basically what you end up doing. It's creating lots of these test cases, just typing in plain text, figuring out the test steps, etc. Now, once we have a test case that exists, that's fine. Every time someone wants to deploy this piece of software or they create a new version, it is where they will basically go in and they will execute these test cases and go and run them. Okay, And that is basically picking out the test case we want to do. We're going to say we're going to execute a new test. We're going to execute a new test execution. Okay. And then we're going to go off and we're going to open this piece of software and we're going to run through those test steps individually. Okay, So here we need to open the URL. So we would go and open a new tab, open that website, wait for it to load, and we will say, yep, that worked, that's fine, that test step passed. Then we're going to enter a first name into the first name field. We can do that. We can see it worked. Okay, that passed. And we'd literally be going through step by step. Someone would have to go through and manually execute each of these test cases. Okay, it's actually very, very boring. It's very tedious, and it's not terribly exciting. Okay, so you know, obviously, it's not pragmatic. You know, someone is going through and they're basically just randomly creating these tests. Okay, it's very slow. Every time I want to release the software, I have to have a team go through and manually run these test cases. And it's also quite expensive, you know, you need to have resources there to actually run these tests. Okay. Now, the area where a lot of companies are moving into at the moment is something called automated testing. Okay. And this is basically scripting test cases, you know, via code to go and interact with an application and go and run those test cases on it. Okay. Now, I would say this is actually quite a lucrative area to get into. There's not a lot of good testers out there who can actually code at the same time. Okay, so for when it comes to you know jobs for automated testing, they typically pay quite a lot of money. Um, there's not that many applicants for them because there's not that many people who know about automated testing, um, but it's actually not very hard. So I'm going to show you a little example of an automation framework that we have here. And I guess the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to right click and I'm going to go to run. Okay. Now, hopefully, what we're going to see is this is going to go through and run my suite of automated tests. Okay. So this is going to go away. It's going to open up Google Chrome. It's going to start entering different data into the different fields that I've specified. And it's basically going to go and run through probably nine or ten different tests here with different combinations of attributes that I care about. Okay. Now, this is just focusing on one form. You know, if you think about some applications, you know, we could register here, then we may want to go through and order a product, go through the checkout page, you know, go through, enter an invalid um, card number, etc. You know, there's lots of different combinations of things I could do. Okay. But automated testing is basically the principle of going into an application and automatically executing the test, which is what it's doing here. Okay. Now, this is using something called Selenium WebDriver, okay? And Selenium WebDriver is basically a way of pragmatically accessing um, a web browser. So that could be Chrome, it could be Internet Explorer, it could be Firefox. Um, there's lots of other web browsers out there now as well which can interact with it. And it's pretty simple. So if we pick out one of these tests that we've got here, this is in Java, okay? And we've basically created um, something that's called page objects. They're basically just objects that exist within a language for interacting with a particular part of the application. So I've created an object which is going to be for um, the new customer account page. Hopefully you can see that. If it's big enough. Maybe I can, can't make it bigger. But here we've got functions within that object like go to the URL, enter the first name, enter the last name, enter an email, enter a password. And at the end, we're clicking the create an account button. Okay, so this is using you know pretty standard object-oriented programming. Okay, now if we look behind these functions, what you'll actually see is that we have ident we have basically um, defined some elements here. 
for picking out these different elements on the page. Okay, so if you look here, firstly, we've got one for the first name, and this has got something that's called an X path sat behind it. Okay, now if you look at this web page in Chrome, this one, obviously sat behind this, it's got all of the HTML that you know defines how that page is kind of built and how it's rendered, right? An X path is basically a way to go into a particular application or a particular XML document and actually narrow down to picking out a particular element on that page, right? So here we've got an identifier for picking out the first name and then navigating down to the input. And that leads to us picking out this input, you know, field within that particular web page, right? So the first piece we have here are the element definitions for the first name, the last name, the create an account button. And then if we go through here, we'll see all the different code we have for actually interacting with the page. So we can go in, we can get a web element, and then we can perform a click operation on it. Um, we can go in, we can enter text into a field. I think down here somewhere, there's the function to go to the URL. Okay, it's really not particularly advanced code. It's actually quite simple. Um, but this is a massive, massive gap in industry at the moment is having automation engineers who can come in and develop this code and write this code in a structured way. Um, there's really not a lot of people out there who can do that. Okay, so that's particularly interesting. And that is basically a way of just going into applications and automating them. Here, obviously, we focused on a web app. It could be a desktop app. Um, in a lot of banks, there's things called mainframe applications. We've done a lot of work with them. Um, basically, any application you can load within you know, Windows, Linux, Mac, um, there's usually a mechanism for automating it um, in some way. Okay. So the benefit of automated testing, it's kind of a little bit more fun. You know, you're not sat there manually writing all of these kind of test cases. You're actually in there in the code, which is a little bit more interesting. Um, it's very fast execution. You know, as you saw there, we ran about 10 different test cases and they went off and they ran pretty much instantaneously. Um, there's still a few problems though, right? Test creation is still manual. You need someone to come in and actually manually create these test cases um, and actually manually script them and define what we should be testing and how we should be testing that system. Um, and it's also very expensive and time consuming, you know, to actually create the tests in the beginning. You need someone with those expertise, which is lacking in the industry. It's a big, big gap. Um, and basically, you need a team of coders who have a testing mindset to go in and create these automated tests, right? So this is where we're going to move more into thinking about visual testing. Um, and this is kind of where our kind of unique piece comes in as Curiosity Software and what we specialize in. Um, and that's something called model-based testing. So I guess I'm going to hand over to you, George. That's all right. Yep. You good? Right, do you want this? Uh, yeah. Let's see if James. Um, so yeah, so what one of our products does um, is essentially this thing called model-based testing. Now model-based testing is all about creating visual diagrams of, um, of your software or the application that you actually want to um, that you actually want to be testing. So if we have a think, you know, stepping away from the technical side of things, so creating a house. So when you're creating a house, the homeowner will more often than not draw some kind of rough sketch of what they want to build. Then you'll have um, like the architects will then come in and say, okay, well, this part of the house isn't gonna work because of whatever reason. Um, and then they'll make edits to that sketch um, until you, know, you come, come around to you know, your plumbers and your electricians who will then use those uh, original sketches to plan where they're gonna um, you know, do the plumbing and plug in all the electrics as well. And that's a really like the principle of what we're doing with, um, with model-based testing. So if I come ahead. Yeah, so we want to apply those same principles of building a house to our software development lifecycle. So we create um, what becomes a graphical model um, of what the software should do and all of the different sort of behavior and um, sort of scenarios that can, uh, that can be undertaken by our testing. So we can, 
we really like to push sort of model-driven de development um, sort of way of thinking. So where the product owner will define requirements in in some kind of model. So instead of what James was doing, where he was you know sat there writing out okay one sentence for that particular requirement, instead what we can do is create our diagrams or our models to define that requirement much much more specifically. Then those testers can use um, the same models to, to generate a set of test cases um, to, you know, to, to test against our application. These models also become the communication asset. So whether you have you know, the developers or the business analyst or the product owner who's actually you know, defining the system, everyone can understand what the model is. You know, you're not having uh, a non-technical person having to go in, look at you know, a wall, of, a wall of text or a wall of code and try to understand, you know, what is actually going on there. So what is Test Modeler? So we, so uh, Test Modeler is an open development platform where we create a centralized reactive model um, of our system under test. Now we can use a whole range of different resources to create that model. So that can be from existing diagrams for, uh, to you know, existing manual test cases that someone might have, um, and things like sort of swagger specs and, and message definitions of what as well. We can import all of those resources into Test Modeler, create you know what is an end-to-end -end test, uh, an end-to-end -end model, and automatically generate those manual test cases that James was um, was talking about there. Now, as we go through, continue to build on that model, we can also then automatically generate the test automation scripts that James was just showing. So instead of having to spend lots and lots of time creating new tests, um, you know, new test scripts, writing manually, uh, my, manually writing code, we can do that all automatically um, with Test Modeler. So I'm now just gonna go um, and just give you a bit of a tour um, of a particular scenario um, inside of that same, um, same system that we were showing just there. So to give us a bit of a head start, um, we have come in and built um, a, a scanner. So this scanner sits on top of your web page, whether it be Chrome or um, Firefox or Internet Explorer. Um, and basically allows you to come through and pick out all of those different identifiers and all of the different elements that we want to interact with um, on that particular page. So if I'm, I'm just going to click on a few of these, you know, first name, last name, email. And if we come in and have a look in the top right here, you can see we've actually picked out some of those identifiers. So in this instance, we've picked out, um, you know, for that first name, we've gone into the sort of input element and picked out the first name using the ID there. And as we go through, you know, we've done that with all of these different ones as well. So whether it be last name or whether it be, you know, clicking on our create an account button. So I can come in and upload these into our workspace. And that creates us um, basically this, this function library. So what James was showing you there with all of the different elements um, and all of the different um, you know, code snippets, that is automatically generated by, by what we're doing here. So if I come in and have a look, you can see, so we've automatically created some of these, um, these functions in here. And if I come in and just export that out, you can see, ah, that's good. Uh, we have, sorry, let me find a better example in here. Da -da. Yeah, there we go. So inside of this field, uh, sorry, inside of this folder, we have that code snippet. So, you know, we've picked out our, our X parts here and we've generated our, um, our functions here. Now, what do we want to do with those particular functions? We can actually use those to rapidly build ourselves um, some, some models. So I'm just gonna come in here, create a new model. And 
and once we load, you'll see what James showed previously, the, the, the canvas that we can use to start to um, map out different user scenarios. Now, we can do this manually. Um, you know, we can come in and you know, drag over our different blocks here. So we have a start node, an end node, and we can come in, overlay specific tasks, um, specific waypoints. So anything that we'd want to, to capture um, the, uh, the functionality of the application. Instead, because we've used our scanner, we can come in and very, very quickly build out those new models. So if I come in here, navigate into our um, function list on the left here, you can see, okay, the first thing we, we need to do is navigate to that particular URL. So we're gonna import that, um, that function on top, of our, uh, on top of our model. Then we want to come in and enter a first name. Then we want to go and enter, for example, a last name. And we'll then just click create an account in this instance. Now you can see very quickly, we've built um, a representative model of that particular system. So, you know, if we come in and have a think about that first name field, there's a couple of things that we can do. We could either enter some kind of valid test data. Um, so that'd be like a, a real first name like George or James, or we could come in and enter some invalid test data. That would be something like, uh, a bunch of special characters or a random number, right? Because in a lot of um, you know, in a lot of programs, if you're trying to create an account, um, if you're entering you know your first name, it's not going to accept a lot of different kind of data, right? It needs specific test data for specific um, sort of journeys through through the system. So we can come through and do that with the rest of these fields. So we've done the same for uh, last name. You know, if we want to enter uh, an empty last name, we just specify an empty string. Uh, and if we want to enter an invalid last name here, we're just going through and pushing through special characters as well. Now, a little bit more interesting is um, these data generation functions. So in the real world, um, we do a lot of work with test data. So in, in this sort of instance, we're specifying test data quite simply. Um, but in a lot of projects that we've worked with, um, we have customers who need to generate quite literally billions of rows of data. Um, so if there's, um, you know, we do a lot of work actually with banking customers, um, quite big ones in, in the UK and in the US. And often, you know, they have these ridiculously complex systems and each system has a ridiculous amount um, of variation. And obviously, because they're very important, like you could be using it to transfer millions of, pa uh, millions of pounds or millions of dollars, um, they need all the data that they can get to test that particular system. So what we do with, um, actually one of our other products that we won't show is we can generate hundreds of millions of, of rows um, of data in ridiculously sized uh, uh, databases and, and hand those over to our customers as well. But in this instance, much more simple. Um, we just have this uh, data generation function. So we have quite a few of these, um, but these are very simple. Like they work in the same way as an Excel function in that whenever it resolves, it will automatically give us um, a new last name. So you can see every time I click preview, we get, we get given a new last name. And we can plug that into our model as well for, for the test data. So now you know how it works, we can then come in and start to generate some of those test cases. So if I go up, hit the generate button, um, you'll see that we get a, a job that spins up that will actually go away and generate some manual test cases um, on, our, on our particular model. Um, so let me just hit generate. So you'll see here, very quickly, we've created four different parts. So as previously, James was going through, he was adding a new row. He was saying, okay, I want to enter a first name and I want to enter the first name as James and you know, define what the expected result is. This time, we've come in and very quickly created that test case. And you can see we have all of the different test steps. Um, we're entering first names, last names, and then clicking on the create an account as well. Now the next step is to then come in 
and generate some automation code. So I can do that. Come in, hit the automation generation button. And if I come in and have a look at the source code, you'll see that um, we generate that Java file. And inside here is uh, you know, the code that we've created. So if we come in and have a look, you can see that we have uh, one test case in here where we're going through, you know, the first step is enter the URL, then we're going to enter our first name, then we're going to enter our last name, and then click on our create an account button. Now we can then come in and execute that test case. So you'll see, you know, a very similar thing to what James showed. Whenever, whenever you hit the execute button, you'll get uh, an automated Chrome browser pop up, and you can see all of your tests run all the way through. And to be honest, it's actually quite satisfying when you can see them all, all run up and you just have to sit there with your arms crossed and watch 20 or 30 test cases pass um, without you having to do anything at all. So hopefully you can see how much faster and how much more interesting it is to use um, this model-based approach. Um, in reality, you know, when you come into the real world, you're gonna have to be doing some kind of testing. Um, and I guarantee, well, from <laughs> all of my experiences, uh, any developer who has to use um, a model-based approach rather than the manual listing um, of test cases and manually scripting automation code. This is much, much quicker, much, much faster, and actually gives you better outputs as well, right? You can generate many, many more test cases um, and meet the requirements of, of your manager or, or whoever, um, yeah, whoever, whoever is running your testing. Okay, so that was sort of a little walk around of um, the, the software itself. Um, and I think we just wanted to end on some, some top tips. I think I'll yeah, pass over to James for this bit. Thanks. I'll just hold this, it's a bit easier. Yeah. Um, I think just, just before we finish up, I mean, what we've looked at here is actually incredibly simple. Um, you know, a lot of the customers that we're working with have these ginormous systems with lots of different business rules in. Um, as George says, you know, especially in the banking space, they can be incredibly complex. You know, it's not just one rule like, you know, if you're under the age of 18, you can have a credit card, you know, application decline, right? It's like if someone has this kind of background, this credit history, they're making a trade on the stock exchange over a certain threshold, then they want to be flagged to the FCA or something, right? And that's just one example of some kind of business rule that they've got in their application, right? Now, when you're thinking about these kinds of, you know, things that are happening, you know, actually testing that system is more of a, uh, oops, just come up here. It's a visualization problem, right? You know, we're trying to test all these different variations. We have no idea, you know, in our head mentally, you know, how we're going to test those different combinations, right? So creating a model is kind of offloading that complexity okay, into the model itself, rather than trying to figure out all these different journeys. But the other piece here is that, you know, you can actually have lots of components connected together, which is this piece here. You know, we can expand them and we can see inside and we can see all the different logic that exists in that specific component of the system, right? So it's all about kind of end-to-end -end testing, being able to visualize, you know, how a system works, how it's being tested. And then out the back end of that, we will produce kind of all of the automation scripts to go with it, right? So I guess we just wanted to kind of finish up just by thinking about kind of some top tips, you know, for where you guys are going, where you're at, um, based off of kind of some of the experience we've had with hiring graduates, working with universities, I guess also from our own experience as well. I think the first tip for me would be just don't stress. I don't think you can go too far wrong. Um, you know, whatever you choose to do in industry, whether you go into a startup, whether you go into a big corporation, um, whatever, there's not really a lot to lose. It's going to be a lot of experience. Um, and that's really going to stand you in good stead, no matter what it is for whatever job you want to go for in the future, right? Um, I think it's very important to have goals and talk about them with people and kind of network and meet other people. I know it's very hard in the world of COVID at the moment, but for me personally, most of my kind of where I've progressed in my career or where I've met people to do business with or whatever, it's been through you know, talking to other people about what I want to achieve, meeting people who are going to help me get to that stage, and then that's going to help me you know, get to wherever I want to be. Right? 
So I think meeting people, networking is really important. Um, in the tech space, everything changes all the time. Um, you know, every two years, three years, there's a new technology, a new framework, a new language. It's almost impossible to be a master of everything, right? And I think, you know, now it's really not about what you know, it's kind of how fast you can learn and pick up these new technologies. So, you know, there's, there's some very funny job adverts on LinkedIn where, you know, there's a new technology out there and they're looking for someone with 10 years of experience in this new space, right? But that technology would, didn't exist 10 years ago, right? So, you know, it's all about how fast can you learn, how fast can you adapt? And, you know, it's not what you learn and what experience you have, in my opinion. Um, you know, we've hired a lot of people who are graduates, who are very young, they've come out of university, and they have by far outpaced some people who have been in the industry for 10, 15 years doing software development. Okay. Um, I think the final one is just, you know, be bold, just go out there, do things. You know, you're in a very good position where you've not really got a lot to lose. So, you know, why not? Just go out there and do something um, and just see what happens, I think. I don't know if you can go too far wrong, personally. Um, but anyway, just to finish up, I guess. Um, so mine and George's emails are up there. Um, we are, you know, expanding rapidly as a company. You know, if any of you are interested in internships, projects, um, you know, or even jobs after university, you know, we'd be really happy to chat more, um, and just have a conversation. Literally just drop us an email. If you're on LinkedIn, you can just Google us and add us. Um, and yeah, we'd be really happy to chat. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Thanks. So I guess it's kind of, if there's any questions, more than happy to answer. If there's anything. Any questions for James or George? Yeah, go ahead. So you mentioned you have a lot of international crowd clients. Did you used to travel before COVID? Or was it all online beforehand? No, it was, it was mostly traveling. So I think before COVID, I probably hadn't been home in about two months, which was like on the road, traveling around to different cities, which was quite fun. It was a bit depressing towards the end, not having a home, but it was fun. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I think a lot has changed now. I mean, for us, it's actually been very beneficial. We would go to a customer site and we would probably maybe do one or two meetings a day just because you're traveling around and that's kind of all you can do. That's your bandwidth, right? Whereas now, you know, if I got out my Outlook calendar and showed you, it would be, we're probably doing about 10 different meetings a day with 10 different clients just because it's the power of the internet and the power of, you know, Teams meetings or Zoom or whatever people are using, right? So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. The dynamics have rapidly changed. Um, I don't think we've done a, a meeting in person for about two years now, personally. It's literally all been online. But yeah, it was mostly traveling before, um, yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, thanks. I have a question now. now sure. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've had your questions before. So, <laughs> so you're, you're in the industry now. Imagine you could zoom back in time to your first year of university. Mm. Is there anything you would have done differently at university, uh, knowing what you know now? It's a good question. I don't know, really. I, I think I was incredibly lucky because you were obviously my supervisor at university, so I'm going to say good things. <laughs> um, but I, I met my now business partner, Fru Bob. Um, it was a guy called Hugh Price, who I still work with. He's my business partner, obviously. Um, and he... Yeah, he took me on, Bob introduced us, he took me on as part of an internship and then that kind of led, you know, on to eventually working for him and then we started a company together. So I think I was very, very lucky. I don't think I would really change anything, per se. Um, I guess it's more the mindset. I remember being a, a student and being, you know, quite apprehensive about what to do afterwards. Like, am I making the right choice doing this, X, Y, Z? But I think... If I look at all my friends and what they did, you know, anything they did was actually hugely beneficial. You know, even the ones who started off, you know, they may not have got the best grades at university, they entered into kind of an entry level job. Um, but then after that, it was all about experience. No one was really looking at the university grades. It was how much experience have you got doing this particular thing? And none of them really took a bad step because they were just building up their experience and moving forward, right? So I think it would, if I could go back and say something, it would be to be less apprehensive about kind of the choices. I don't think you could make a wrong decision, to be honest. I mean, I, I would just say, 
I'd just say to get involved in as much as you possibly can. Like there's nothing extracurricular or um, you know working on a project that would be bad for your prospects, right? Because if you can go to an employer, um, obviously you'll have your computer science degree, but if you can say, okay, in my second year I did a month's project on um, you know building this application with my friend or or something that's maybe offered by the university, right? If they have like a, a three month project. Um, where you might think, oh, okay, is that really interesting? But if you look, you know, in, in three or four years' time, if you look back at, you know, your university time, the, the, the things that will stand out are like those extracurricular things um, and like real projects that you can point to and you can say, okay, I built this thing. Um, it, I, it worked or it didn't work, but I had the, I had the, the knowledge of the process um, of, you know, failing and then, you know, fixing it and perhaps being successful. Um, and those are things I think that would really sort of make you stand out um, from others who throughout the university might just do the bare minimum, um, just go to the classes, do the mandatory projects, etc. etc. Um, so yeah, I would just say get involved with as much as you possibly can. Uh, nothing is going to Thank you, everyone.